Uh, welcome to the course on industrial automation and control. Today we are going to have uh, lecture lesson 2 which is on uh, which is on architecture of industrial automation systems. Industrial automation systems as a whole are uh, quite complex entities. If you go to a factory, you will find a bewildering array of equipment, controllers, sensors, uh, operator displays, uh, various cabinets containing hardware. So all these together make a factory work like an orchestra. So today we are going to, since it's a since it's a complex operation with uh, various kinds of equipment uh, which uh, harmonize themselves with one another, before we take uh, take a detailed look at each one of them, it is useful to look at the look at the operation of the whole system, and see how the various parts relate to each other. So that is the basic purpose of this lecture, to understand the how this complex system is organized, how, what are the various elements in the system, how they relate to each other, what roles they perform, how they interact with each other. So that in short defines the architecture. So having said that, let us look at the uh, specific instruction objectives of this course. So since the industrial automation system being a complex system is definitely organized hierarchically in various levels, so the first specific in, uh, instructional objective is naturally to name, to be aware of the various levels of industrial automation. The second objective is to relate, to describe the hierarchical structure of industrial automation systems by which I mean that to know what these levels do, to, uh, to, to be able to understand how in one interacts with another, what, one, what information one accepts from, uh, from one, from another and how does it, what information does it give to the other. So that will describe the hierarchical structure then describe the essential functions that are achieved at each level and specifically speaking since industrial automation is in a sense a lot of industrial automation actually is concerned with control and control is of two kinds as we shall explain shortly it could be automatic control or it could be supervisory control. So it is important to realize the distinction between the two. So the last instructional objective is to understand the how automatic control is distinguished from supervisory control. So now let us look at the industrial automation pyramid as a whole. Why is it a pyramid? It is a pyramid because there are several levels, so it has a vertical dimension. So we have the lowest levels of sensors and actuators which interact with the 
which directly interact with the process or or the machine so they actually get the signals from the process of the machine now these sensors and actuators are actually act as the eyes and the arms of uh, of the controllers so on top of these we have the automatic control layer which is called level 1 now a number of automatic controls are again managed at the supervisory control layer which we call level 2 finally the operation of a particular shop floor as a whole is controlled I mean the whole overall manufacturing operation including uh, maintenance production quality assurance inventory everything is uh, managed at another level which is called production control and finally right at the top we have enterprise control which is which is more like a I mean basically consists of management functions where uh, not only the production related operations are uh, considered but even other operations like sales, uh, mm, sales, marketing, new product development everything is considered and production is considered just as a part of it that is level 4. Now at this point we should I should mention that while these functionalities are necessary for the overall control of a factory but it often turns out that 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 not necessarily all these layers are perfectly automated what I mean to say is that generally sensors and actuators must be automated there is there are there are equipment for it automatic control layers are also automated there is there are most operations are not manually controlled but from the supervisory control layer upward it is not always true that you have you know computer based automation for functioning the the uh, for performing the the operations of that level in fact some of these operations may very well be done by human beings for example uh, if you go to a if you go to a power plant or if you go to a big refinery you will find that in invariably on the on the shop floor you will have you will have a you will have a control room if you enter the control room it is usually a very large room where in the when in the center of it you will you are you are very likely to find that there are a number of large computer monitors and there are a group of people who are actually sitting around these monitors and con constantly looking at these so they are generally the process supervisors or the or the operators who perform a lot of supervisory control functions so at the supervisory control level uh, there could be some functions which are automated while some functions could be performed manually also at the at the production control level most of the operations most of the time are performed by human with the aid of tools which help people perform the the production control functions so that's why we have what is known as a production manager or say in a, say in a power station we have a shift charge engineer who is who is who is in charge of running the overall power system uh, overall power plant for a for a certain duration of time so this production control functions are invariably a mix of manual as well as automated tools similarly enterprise management functions are also like that you have you have managers who use tools for performing their functions so we have level 0 level 1 level 2 level 3 and level 4 now uh, having said that let us look at the these levels and their natures with a certain uh, some more detail so first of all we would like to point out and uh, this is why this system is called a pyramid is because that as you go up up the pyramid the spatial scale and the temporal scale or the time scale of a given system at that level increase now, now what do I mean by that so for example consider one sensor system 
one sensor system measures one process variable in the whole machine. So, it looks at only that variable. So, in that sense, its spatial scale is actually related, is actually very, very, very limited. So, in a in the in the whole shop floor, there are there are several machines. In each machine, there are several uh, process variables, and the sensor, which is at level zero, only looks at one of them. So, in that sense, it is spatially its scope is very limited. Similar, but its interaction is over a very small time scale. That is, it gives over sampling times it gives values to the controller. So, each value represents the variable over a very short time. So, in that sense it has a very each value which comes out from the sensor has a very short time scale. Now, as you go up for example, if you go to automatic control, automatic control also works at the sampling level in the sense that it computes control in uh, control input for the plant at each sampling point. But while it is designed, sometimes considerations are uh, made of larger duration. For example, when you say that the settling time should be low. Now, when you are considering settling time, you are actually considering that if you make a step change, then from one operating point to another, how does the output reach from one level to another? So, so, so typically you are concerned about a duration of time which spans over several sampling points, right. So, if you go to supervisory control level, supervisory control level one of one of the major functions is to, ch is to change the set point and set point changes are not made every every moment. Control input changes are fed to the plant every sampling time, but, but set point changes are not made every sampling time definitely, they are made over. Uh, let us say typically some hours, right? if, if, if you take a power system boiler. So, at it will be oper say at say at 3 o'clock in the night it may be operating at 10 percent load, at 7 o'clock in the morning it may be operated at 25 percent load, at, at around 9, 9 30 there is huge amount of load comes in the power system because all the offices open up and things like that. So, between 9:30 and 11 o'clock, it it will it will ramp up significantly from let us say 30 percent load to nearly 90 percent load perhaps. Then that 90 percent load it will maintain till again say let us say 5 o'clock. I, I mean after about 5 o'clock, it will I mean evening will come and people will switch on various kinds of lighting loads. So then you will get the evening peak load. So when only when the load will significantly increase will the boiler uh, operating point be changed, right. So, the operating point of a boiler typically gets changed uh, let us say 7, 8, 10 times over a day and its change is also based on the I mean the decisions for change are taken based on periods of hours, right. So, in that sense it is it is on a larger temporal scale. It is also on a on a on a much larger spatial scale because every sense one sensor looks at one signal, one automatic controller may be taking control action taking several sensors into account. So, in that sense it its spatial scale is now increased. Now, one supervisory controller will typically look after a number of automatic control loops and it typically looks after one piece of equipment like a like a like a boiler or a or a or a furnace or a distillation column. Typically, they will have many automatic control loops. Similarly, a shop floor may be made of several such units or machines. So, the production control is done typically at the shop level, while the enterprise control is done at the overall enterprise level. So, as you go up, you, you can understand that the the time scale is increasing and this and the spatial scale is also increasing. That is why it is a pyramid and not a cylinder. If you look at, so having clarified that, let us look at the uh, nature of technology which is used for, for automation at these various levels. So, at the at the lowest level when you have when you have uh, sensors and when you have sensors and actuators, uh, 
so here you have mostly you have hardware things are you know either they are actual sensing elements or their packaging elements or electronic circuits or microprocessors they are they are generally very hardware oriented nowadays we are also having software along with that but the software is also very close to the hardware in the sense that uh, they they actually interact very close to the hardware and they are written specifically to for that hardware so in that sense we have a lot of you know what is known as embedded technology at this level so this is this word embedded is because it is the kinds of actually the sensor is supposed to be embedded in the machine so you know all the uh, this this technology is uses embedded hardware and software when you go to the automatic control level then it happens in many cases that there it's a it's it's a separate hardware it's not embedded into the process into the machine it's a separate tangibly separate piece of hardware which runs again which runs real time software the the software is generally generic it's not very special purpose but it runs on often it runs on special purpose hardware like you know like tlcs industrial pcs or some uh, dsp processors so but the algorithms are generally generic like uh, a pid control uh, pid control is a very generic uh, control algorithm which is used for a number of uh, process control uh, applications but the software is real time in the sense that outputs must be generated within a given amount of time because every sampling time you have to generate the control inputs to the plant so you have real time software hardware is special purpose or general purpose both are possible if you go to supervisory control you will find that hardware is mostly general purpose it's 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 general purpose computers of course with a with a strong data interface because lots and lots of channels of data from the from the whole process come to this the software is still online online because it's the the difference between what is i mean some i mean a piece of software is called online if it's acquired if it interacts with the external world so it acquires so it works on the data which is continuously streaming in from the process using sensors and uh, various communication channels but uh, but it's not very hard real time by hard real time i'm i mean a an application i mean a software application is called hardware real time when the execution must be must be finished within a time deadline if it does not finish then uh, serious consequences may occur and the and the system may fail but these generally work these could are generally a mix of mostly soft real time in the sense that well things must be done in time but even if but they are not so hard that is if you one does not uh, one particular piece of computation cannot be finished in time then some performance degradation may result but in general the system as such will not fail uh, for example one of the one of, one of the main purposes of this supervisory control layer is to update the the man machine interface that is whoever is the operator he has to be shown how the process is performing plot the graph plot various statistics etc so these are typically soft real time operations in the sense that obviously you cannot display a variable uh, uh, 30 minutes after you have got it uh, right but as long as you display it in time whether you are displaying it within 2 seconds or whether within 10 seconds is not of much consequence so to that extent it is called soft real time <coughs> software is i mean the hardware is general purpose but the software is very very special purpose that is supervisory control software for and for a refinery will be completely different from that of a power plant which will be completely different from that of a uh, let's say a manufacturing plant so they are uh, they are very specific to the machine the software but the hardware is general purpose production control does not bother about machines as such they don't they are not really concerned about they are they take an abstract view of the factory how many pieces of equipment are being produced per hour whether that piece of equipment is actually uh, whether it's a whether it's a gear or whether it's an engine uh, box or, or 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 whether it is nuts and bolts it does not matter so machines are looked at as general purpose i mean service providers or material transformers so you give it a you give a milling machine a blank it will produce a gear 
So, what is the exact technology of the milling machine? Uh, it is not of interest at this offline level. What is of interest is how many pieces of parts it can produce, whether it is functional or whether it is non functional, such things, right. So, the software is generally offline and it uses it, it does use various kinds of algorithms, but uh, they are of a totally different nature and uh, they do not generally they do not they are not concerned as such with the machines themselves, but take an abstract view of production. Similarly for similarly for enterprise level. So, at these two levels and to some extent at the supervisory level, we are not so much close to hardware that is we look at the process as an as an abstract entity and we take decisions about them and we analyze the performance we, we also monitor them. So, in that sense the layers up to from some parts of some parts of supervisory control as well as production control and enterprise control I would like to term them as industrial information technology rather than industrial automation technology you know automation has a has a kind of hardware flavor it's a it has a kind of hardware real time software kind of flavor so so while industrial information technology also contains lot of technology resource optimization technology scheduling technology uh, etc but they are not concerned so much about hardware they are, they are generally generic technologies and they are uh, non real time so in that sense i would like to uh, distinguish between industrial automation and industrial information technology. So, in this course we will take we will take predominant focus is on this on the first three layers we will see layer 1 and layer layer 0 very uh, in in some depth we will also look at some automation technologies which are now being deployed for supervisory control. So, so that now Another thing that needs to be said is that these layers actually exchange information. So, sensors collect con are, are continuously collecting samples of measurements, which they are passing over to automatic controller. Similarly, the automatic controller is continuously computing control input, which they are passing over to the actuator. Now, similarly, the information that the sensors and actuators are uh, that the automatic controllers are receiving from the sensors part of it they are actually passing to the supervisory control layer to see whether the control loop is is working satisfactorily or whether some set point change is needed. So, or whether there is some malfunction some sensor has failed and the and the process output is going out in which case the supervisory controller must take some action. So, it can either change the set point or if there are two sensors it can it, it can switch from one sensor to the other. So, it gives command. So, so you can see that there is continuous information flow from there is information flow from the lower level to the upper and from the upper level to the lower. And as information goes up because of the spatial and time scale information continuously gets aggregated up. So, you you as you go higher and higher you get more and more time averaged information over a part of the factory. As you come lower and lower you are get, you get more and more detailed information about a smaller and smaller part of the machine. So, as you go up information gets aggregated as you come down information gets resolved. So, there is resolution or, or refinement occurring ok. Now, how do all this information flow up and down physically how do they transmit? So, nowadays I mean lot of stress is being uh, put on. So, there is usu usually a communication system which actually connects all these devices so that they can seamlessly uh, exchange information, send results. In fact, lot do do a lot of configuration management various kinds of things. So, there is a there is a if you see the industrial automation market you will find lot of activity here and uh, some 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 new trends emerging in in the factories which we will review in this course. So, having got this kind of an idea about the overall industrial automation system we would like to take a look at uh, 
Now, we will like to take some look about some more detailed look at these various levels and one before we do that we, we, we must understand that much of this technology the much of the part the of industrial automation that we are going to concern ourselves with is a is actually about control. So, we should first see what are the elements of control of industrial control. So, the structural elements. So, what is basically done in control? Why do we control? We control because we want that the outputs or some process related variables which could be temperature, which could be pressure or we, we, we want them to behave in certain ways that we desire. So, we have some desirable behavioral pattern and we want to achieve those behavioral patterns. That is we want the we want the temperature to let us say ramp up in a certain over time, then be held constant, then after some time ramp down, things like that. So, so obviously we achieve it. So, how do we achieve this? We achieve it by comparing the output with whatever we want and then so so to be able to compare we need to feed the output so that is done by the sensor i am sorry this goes back this has to go back yeah so uh, right so so that you do by the sensor then when you compare you get here you get what is known as the error so you give the error to the controller then the controller node knows that what control input to give such that the error is minimized. Now, the controller is actually a basically a computing system. So, its input is actually logical, it is not physical input. So, before giving to the plant, in the plant if you want to change some process variable you have to cause uh, steam flow rate change or you have to ca cause some motion change, some 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 valve position change etcetera etcetera. So, some physical change has to occur. So, for that you need what is known as an actuator. So, the job of the actuator is to produce the physical change which is proportional to the logical change which is commanded by the control. And then hopefully if that physical change occurs then the plant output will change in such a manner that the error will reduce. So, this is the job of control. So, now, let us see. So, so, we have identified the major elements. So, the elements are sensor, actuator and controller. Now, this desired value, where do we get this desired value from? This we get from the from level 2. That is a supervisory controller calculates this desired value. So, here we have these two we have level 0, here we have level 1 and here we have level 2. So, this is the relationship. Now, let us see each of these levels. So, first let us look at a sensor. So, sensor what is the job? The job is to produce an information which accurately represents a physical variable, right. So, so obviously, there is some variable conversion required. This information is generally first obtained in, in, in electrical form and after that it is converted into pure information from form using you know digital electronics. So, what is necessary? Very simple. First of all you need something which will convert the physical medium, let us say temperature. It will convert into some other form so that some electrical signal can be generated. So, maybe the sensing element will convert this to a resistance change. Now, this resistance change is still not an electrical signal which can be manipulated. So, you need signal conditioning. So, you put this resistance into some bridge and produce a voltage which is proportional to this resistance change. So, all these are proportional. This is proportional to this and uh, this is proportional to this. So, finally, the, the voltage is proportional to the temperature. Now, this voltage may contain various you know impurities, noise, etcetera. So, you do further some signal processing on it so that you get more accurate voltages or you increase its strength or do something. Then at this point, you have got it in the information form. It, 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 it is no longer a process variable, physical, neither electrical, it becomes information. 
So, this information now has to be used. So, used in what sense? So, you so, so you can either display it or you can uh, transmit it to a controller or you can store it in some database. So, finally, you have to use this. So, so, so here you may have a display. So, by target handling element, it could be a display or it could be a network card. So, it could be a network interface by which it will get transmitted or it could be a disk on which it will be stored. So, depending on the usage of the signal, you have you, you have to deal with it. So, basically this is when you say an industrial sensor, you, you, will, you, you will obviously find a sensing element. You will also find some signal conditioning element nowadays because of ruggedness of electronics, this, this signal conditioning is getting transferred into the sensor itself. You can have some signal processing like filtering and then finally, it will be used in a display, right. So, this is a sensor. Now, let us take a look at uh, some characteristics. So, obviously, you have a sensing element. One thing that needs to be mentioned is that industrial sensor, apart from the basic sensing element, they also have you know other uh, protective elements uh, like, uh, like if you have a thermocouple. Basically, a thermocouple are is a, as we have seen that they are as we will be seeing, they are actually two pieces of wire. Now, when you are trying to measure the temperature industrially, you do not put those two pieces of wire directly into the fire. So, what you do is you, you, you have what is called a thermo well. So, you put the thermocouple, those two wires in the thermo well and you put the thermo well in the fire, so that they, it, it does not get destroyed. So, when I say a sensing element, a sensing element could comes along with its all, all its packaging and this packaging can have some effect on the control performance of the loop because they have their own dynamics. You know, thermo wells have introduced time constants into thermocouples, as we'll see. So, so, so we have a sensing element. Now, after the sensing element, we have signal conditioning and processing. So, so the job of signal conditioning is to transfer to electrical form, and then signal processing is to do further processing for some improvement, like you know, making making linearization. Suppose some signal is varying according to square, we do we want to make it linearly variable, so we can have a square root operation, we can have a filter to, to strip out noise, we can correct bias, we can add bias, whatever we want. So, they in general signal conditioning means uh, that converting to an electrical form, generally analog and then signal processing is could be analog, it is could be digital also. So, you have analog electronic signal conditioning followed by digital processing. Now, digital processing could be of various types. Digital processing for what? So, digital processing could be for signal processing, let us say filtering. Digital processing could be for diagnostics calibration configuration. This is a, this is a very modern functionality. If you have a microprocessor, you have a, you have a lot of computing power at your hand. So, you can do more than just doing filtering. So, you can you can for example, you can perhaps detect whether the thermocouple wire has broken. So, whether the, whether the sensor is at all functioning. So, that is diagnostics. Uh, okay. Does it go back? Mm, okay. Yeah. No, so, it does not go back. Uh, fine. So, so, so that is diagnostics. Sometimes you could have, you know, sensors, sensor characteristics sometimes degrade. For example, suppose a sensor develops a bias. You can have algorithms to actually detect, detect the bias and you can do it its own calibration. You can, you can send information that I have, that is a sensor can send an information or sensor can be inter interrogated and you can find the information that it has developed a bias. So, its readings will be interpreted accordingly for greater accuracy or it can do its own configuration management. You know, people send generic devices which are flexibly configurable. So, if it has a filter, what will be the time constants of the filter? That depends on what signal it is filtering, what is the bandwidth of the signal it is filtering. So, if it is sensing, uh, if it is filtering a flow sensor, its bandwidth will be larger than if it is filtering a temperature signal. So, 
it may be possible to even automatically set these filters. So, such the things are done by digital processing plus another major, major function is communication. So, nowadays sensors are all going to be you know communication uh, enabled. So, they can they will either connect to networks or they will connect to some some you know remote terminal unit for which will connect to network. So, there is some uh, there is digital processing done for uh, this this communication function also. Uh, followed by finally, there is signal protection and transmission that is after finally, uh, for everything uh, you need to transmit the signal. So, you can have a it were you can have a network interface or sometimes you can have a voltage to current converter. If you are having a 4 to 20 milli ampere transmission, then you can have a voltage to current converter. If you are having RS 422 kind of uh, transmission, then they have specified voltage levels. So, you have to have voltage conversion of that. So, a typical what I wha what I wanted to show is that if you if you come across a typical industrial sensor system, then what will it contain and what it will contain what all do they do. So, if you if you buy a uh, let us say a smart temperature sensor from a company and or if you go through its brochure, then you will typically find that these functionality some of these functionality will be supported. So, having said that let us look at the next element which is uh, which is actuators. So, what do actuators do? Actuators as I said that they, they take the logical input from the controller and then they convert it to a physical plant input that is what they do. Now, obviously, what is necessary for this? There is variable conversion necessary. And generally, one thing is very much necessary is that these logical inputs are just logical, they do not have power, they have the information. So, you have to do lot of power amplification. If you want to increase the temperature in a furnace, then just saying that you make uh, you giving a signal from a from a microprocessor is not going to do it. So, you have to take the signal and then you have to you have to move some big maybe fuel uh, injection valve and you have to change the speed of the fan which is which is which is putting air into the furnace and you have to you have to increase combustion rate only then temperature will increase right so the main so there are two things done one is variable conversion second thing is big amount of power amplification is to be done so that is what is done by the actuator now, actuators now we have to remember that here we are having a very powerful thing and not only that we want to have precise control because our obje always our objective is to have precise control. So, we here is a very powerful thing which we will have to control precisely. So, for that we always use feedback control. Therefore, actuators themselves actually are feedback control devices they they themselves take feedback. For example, if you want to if you want to move a let us say, I mean, typical example, I mean, uh, non-industrial, but typical example is take an aircraft. When it is flying, then it has to move its control surface against huge amount of aerodynamic load, and these control surface motion must be very, very precise. So, unless you implement this actuator, which is the control surface actuator in this case, uh, unless this, or, or or let us say, the speed of a motor, unless you put these in in a, in a in a feedback you can never achieve that precision. So, therefore, actuators are typically the actuators themselves is a control loop. So, so they have their own sensors, they also have controllers, sometimes they have some analog signal processing. For example, uh, sometimes it may happen that you know some the the controller may give some control input, but in that control input certain frequencies must be eliminated because they cause resonance, they, they may cause a lot of vibration etcetera. So, in so in such a case you, you, you can do some signal processing that you ok that input is given, but that frequency is filtered out may be using a notch filter. So, such signal processing may be done 
and obviously power amplification some amount of electrical power amplification is done. So, you, you use what is known as servo amplifiers. So, so, servo amplifiers will take weak signals and will accurately exactly proportionally multiply them, but with but with lot of power amplification. Now, after this now you have some actually in an actuator so much power amplification is necessary that it is always done in stages. So, you have power amplification first one level power amplification which is in the electrical level. So, you take one electrical signal and increase its electrical power, but after that you have to if you want to increase power further often it happens that we go to different forms of energy. So, we can have if we have a motor driven actuator then sometimes it is driven directly from the from the power amplifier or sometimes it may be driven from uh, it may be driven using hydraulic or pneumatic devices. You know there are there are there are there are certain advantages especially hydraulics can handle a lot of power in a small volume. So, the so in a small hydraulic motor you can handle a lot of power. So, when we have large power devices we use hydraulic and pneumatic. So, we so they are also like amplifiers they are also like power amplifiers only they take an electric signal. So, you have electro hydraulic or you have electro pneumatic typically actuators. Finally, at this point of time you have got you have generated that necessary process input which you wanted to cause with a lot of power. So, that will cause now even 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 that may go through for example, if you if, if you have a if you have a if you have a hydraulic element it will finally produce what it will probably it will probably be applied to the stem of a valve. So, that so that tremendous pressure will be created to the stem of the valve it will so still you have to have the valve because you want to control flow. So, what you want to control here is flow let us say. So, for controlling that you need to move a valve this is the final action element. So, you have a control valve. Now, you need to open it or close it. Now, how do you open it or close it? So, you need to move its stem. So, this hydraulic system will actually move the stem. This sensor will will sense stem position. And this controller will give input such that the the here is the desired here is the desired stem position. So, this controller will give input. So, this is a total closed loop operated valve actuator which will control flow in the plant which in turn may control temperature whatever. So, having understood this operation let us now look at uh, the actuator what do you find just like we found did for an industrial sensor let us see what we are going to do for the actuators. So, the industrial actuator systems you will find <coughs> again you will find electronic signal processing you will find power amplification as we have said you will find electro hydraulic pneumatic or mechanical elements you will find feedback control for precision exact value will be reached. You will find lots of auxiliaries because these devices have to be operated they are generally power devices. So, they need <coughs> additional auxiliary systems for lubrication cooling filtering etcetera. You will have you may have subsystem which are used for remote operation you know some of these actuators are may need not be operated just just from close they may be operated from a distance right. So, <coughs> regularly done in power systems when you have where you have you know unmanned substations. So, you have to I mean how do you close a switch or or open a switch you just from some remote control uh, station you give a signal and the switch and the circuit breaker opens or closes. So, the circuit breaker is the actuator. Similarly, for safety you may find lots of you know various kinds of release pressure release valves or various kinds of interlocks because these are you know powerful devices so if they malfunction they may cause accidents. So, special uh, systems are used. Similarly, you since they consume some amount of energy you will find special systems which will uh, <coughs> which will try to save energy in the actuator itself. 
you know, so some freewheeling or some switching off, uh, I mean, unnecessary uh, energy devices, you, you may find uh, technologies for this. So, typically, uh, this is this is what you will find in an in an industrial actuator, and we then in the future classes we'll look at various kinds of industrial actuators in detail. So now we have covered sensors and actuators in level zero. Now we come to level one, which is an automatic control loop. We have already seen the automatic control loop. We, we at that time we have seen the structural elements of the loop. Now what are we saying? Now we are we'll concentrate on what the loop is going to do. What is the job of the loop? As I said before, the job of the loop, this has changed, let me go back, yeah, let me lock this. So the job of the controller is uh, to maintain the set point, that is its job, which is given, comes from the supervisory control. So, so why should the set point change? Why is it? Uh, once I set it caref carefully, why why should it change? It, it 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 changes because of disturbance. For example, suppose uh, you are cutting metal. Now, the metal is inhomogeneous. So this is the metal which you are cutting. That is a piece of let us say steel, is not homogeneous. You have set a particular cutting speed, depth, depth of cut, speed. You have you have set, and the and the machine is rotating. Now suppose the there is some parts come where the material density is is different. Then the speed will fall. Speed may fall. So if and if speed falls in metal cutting, the 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 quality of cutting suffers. And you have no control over what kind of uh, material uh, qualities will be supplied to you in the in the raw material. So, or for example, suppose you have a rolling mill. So, in a rolling mill, the load on the shaft is depends on the depends on the depends on two things: depends on the material that you are rolling, and depends on its temperature. In fact, that's I mean, in we, we are talking about hot rolling. So, so as you are uh, varying, so if the temperature varies, the load on the motor will will vary enormously, and and therefore the speed will vary. Now you don't want to allow that. So what I'm trying to say is that because of these load disturbances, if you if you set a particular speed, that may not be obtained. So to ensure that, you have you have an you have feedback control. Right. Plus, there may be sensor noise also. There's a feedback may be erroneous. So, it is basically because of these two that the uh, that the control problem becomes non-trivial. Plus, many other things may happen. For example, one of the things that is very regularly happens is that the actuator saturation. This is a very regular thing in actuator saturation. That is, the actuator cannot really drive. Enough input into the plant as the controller wants. Actually, the controller makes unreasonable demands on the actuator. The actuator cannot give. So it is because of these things that the that the that the control problem is not elementary, and uh, you have you have various kinds of difficulties. So we will look at now. We will look at the. Having said this, let us look at the various kinds of things that you find in a in an industrial controller. Oh, sorry. So when so let's look at automatic control. Automatic control again. I must mention this. This I have not mentioned. Can be of two types. The first type is what I call continuous variable control. That's what we are familiar with. We have already most of us have taken a course in that, called automatic control system or control systems or control engineering. There we study mainly continuous variable control, where we are interested in controlling the value of a variable. Let that let the temperature be 200 degrees centigrade. That kind of control, where the where the temperature is a continuous variable in the sense that it can continuously vary over time, it can take any value. So, th this control we control analog continuous process variables. That's fine. 
and typically we apply what is what we understand by closed loop control which you have seen. So, the main objective is to track or hold set points that is the output should, should follow the set point. If the set point changes it should track it, if the set point is constant it should hold it irrespective of disturbances. So, it should reject disturbances both in the sensor as well as load disturbances as well as in the actuator. Now, for this purpose we it is said it is that more than about 80 85 percent of all industrial controllers are a, a particular class of controllers called PID controllers. So, they are generally these control algorithms used are, are generic though in some cases you may use some special purpose controllers. Now, because they are generic they have to be tuned for a specific plan. So, you have to set controller gains for, for that specific plan and that is called tuning. So, these controllers are tunable and they require tuning from time to time and they are implemented typically on digital real time systems like basically a basically a processor system with an interface with the sensors and with an interface to the actuator. So, it is a it is a it is a kind of microprocessor based system and they are these are generally very inexpensive typically a control system is less than 5 percent cost of the plant it controls. So, the so the controller is actually very cheap although it does a very critical job. So, now so this is what you find in automatic control now let us automatic continuous variable control. Similarly, you have sequence or discrete event control. Now, in discrete event control uh, what you what you have is that you have control of discrete valued process variables that is variables which cannot take continuous values, but either they are they take discrete values like like you know on and off or low medium high. So, you have to control. So, so now you see values are all constant values. So, there is not much point in trying to control the value. So, so what do you control? So, you try to control the sequence. So, what happens after what or you control timing that is when exactly will this valve close that is 5 minutes after the valve opens you should switch on the pump and similarly 2 minutes after the pump is switched off you should switch off the valve. So, such th things such control is called discrete event control. So, obviously, they use sensors which are also discrete that is they so like you know uh, limit switches just sense whether something is in, is in this position or that position pressure switch senses whether the pressure is high or low photo switch senses whether a part is placed on the conveyor belt or not. So, use you use this kind of sensors. You you have lot of you know interlock or uh, alarms. So, you do interlock and alarm processing in this. Typical hardware which is used for discrete event controllers are programmable logic controllers, sometimes industrial PCs, and sometimes could be very you know uh, special purpose uh, dedicated processors, right. So, they they obviously do not need tuning and uh, they are. Uh, so, you have Tata sequencing and timing control. Uh, so, so one, one good thing about them is that unless the control logic changes they do not need tune. So, this is the story of automatic control. Now, we will one, one last thing that we will uh, consider here is uh, supervisory control and we will stop here today because production control and enterprise control are functions which uh, which can be which we are not going to cover in great detail in this course. So, we will introduce them later if we have uh, when we have one or two int int introductory courses uh, introductory lectures le or, or lessons in this course. So, let us look at this picture this this picture explains what a supervisory controller does. So, previously we had seen one control loop now I am fine this is the process that we want to control. So, this is the process this is the feedback of the control loop 
but we are having a number of controllers here. So, suppose one controller is working. So, as we have said that what does the supervisory controller do? It gives command, it gives set point. That is the automatic controller just maintains a temperature, it does not know what temperature to maintain. If it is told that you maintain 200 degree centigrade, it will do its best to maintain 200 degree. But whether to maintain 200 degree or to maintain 115 degree, that the automatic controller does not know. That information must come from the supervisory controller. So, so it gives set point, but it does another very important thing that is it is not always that you are going to use the same controller. For example, the controller that you may be using during the during the time that the that a, that a plant is started up from let us say cold condition or when a plant is shut down, they are actually totally different control laws. So, so you may have more than one control law. So, if you are doing start up, you use this controller. If you are doing shut down, you use another controller when you are doing normal operation you do you use another controller. So, you must give commands as to which controller to use when. So, that command comes from the supervisory controller. So, it gives various kinds of commands. Uh, for example, suppose there is some there is some accident or there is some there is some malfunction in the equipment immediately you have to do emergency shutdown. So, so, so the supervisory controller must understand that 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 there is a malfunction. How does it understand? because it also gets the process inputs and outputs. So, based on this process inputs and output, it does lot of calculation to, to always check whether the system is working nicely. If it finds some problem, immediately it will give various commands to, uh, to ensure which controller to use when. So, a supervisory controller actually manages a number of automatic controllers, right. So, having said that, let us see its basic, uh, oh I see, uh, so what are the features of supervisory control, I am sorry what is this happening here, oh. So, first point is set point computation, one very important thing is that set point computation is very important in manufacturing from the point of view of energy quality and production volume. Unless you give proper set points, you will not get product of certain quality, you may be wasting lot of energy in producing it and the amount of production will also fall. So, so, so that is why supervisory control is so critical and it is sometimes and it is often done by very experienced operators manually. So, it is very critical for manufacturing. So, it, it does start up, shut down and various kinds of emergency operations. It does control reconfiguration and tuning, you may have to change the controller from time to time. It does performance monitoring, is the loop properly tuned, is there a sensor malfunction, it continuously checks. It provides an operator interface, it provides with nice graphs to the operator who also sees. They are generally based on obviously all this can be done based specific to an equipment, it cannot be done otherwise. So, and they work as I said in hard soft hard and soft real time scenarios. So, having said that we will, they are also very expensive because they are specific to a process. We will speak, we will skip this slide altogether because we do not want to. So, we, we are just looking at the various uh, uh, various elements in this this thing like product process scheduling, material handling, maintenance management, inventory management, quality management and resource optimization technology. They are as I have mentioned that they may be online, but they are non real time. Some of them may be online. So, finally, we have a lesson review. So, what we have done in this lecture, we have looked at the hierarchy, hierarchical structure of industrial automation. We have looked at level 0, the sensors and actuators, what they do and what technologies are found in them. We have looked at level 1, automatic control. We have also looked at continuous variable and discrete event control and distinguished them. We have looked at supervisory control and we have understood how they are different from automatic control. And finally, we just took a cursory look at production control.
enterprise control we are not going to even have a look at cut, uh, not going to have a cursory look at because this is essentially a business management operation so here we have some problems points to ponder for example can you explain the differences between continuous variable and discrete event control can you cite two or three differences can you draw the block diagrammatic structure of an industrial sensor and give an example let us say you you locate some industrial sensor and then try to identify that what are the various block diagrams i mean what are the various sub subsystems in it what are their functions can you define automatic control and distinguish it from supervisory control with an example and finally can you state three major functions for each level of the automation pyramid so these are problems for you to ponder on and thank you very much